Okay, I'm going to get started then. Um, so thank you very much, Ulis, for um, the introduction. And I'd warmly like to welcome everyone who is attending um, today and also who is going to watch this later on in the cloud. Um, so you're all very welcome. Um, it's great to see um, so many people. Um, so I, as Ulis said, uh, with Ulis, we are the uh, co-directors of the Strathclyde Centre uh, for Internet Law and Policy. And this is the first of our webinars um, that we are running since, um, well, normal life ceased and uh, we could no longer run um, in-person events. Um, so I'm going to give a brief introduction to our research centre uh, before I talk about the substance of uh, the presentation um, on 3D printing, policing and crime. And then there should be some um, scope for questions and answers at the end as well. Okay, so a brief introduction to the centre. Um, so we are the Centre for Internet Law and Policy uh, based at Strathclyde University, which is in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, for those of you who don't know. Uh, we're a research centre based in the Department of Law, part of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And we have quite a wide range of interests in different areas of law and policy which relate to internet and now more broadly digital matters. Um, so intellectual property, cybercrime, which is relevant to my presentation today. Uh, we also um, do a lot of work on competition and regulation of digital markets, uh, human rights and internet uh, policy and data protection as well. Um, and we're a group of about 10 people at the moment, uh, both PhD students and academics at different stages. Uh, we also have some collaborators from other areas. Internet law and policy is a very interdisciplinary area, of course, um, and in particular colleagues from uh, computer science in Strathclyde um, who collaborate with us on interdisciplinary research. Okay, um, so in terms of our um, activities, um, we conduct research on all of these themes. Uh, we produce uh, research and policy advice about internet law and policy issues um, at, with different geographical uh, focuses. So obviously we're located in Scotland, in the UK, in Europe, so we do um, research on topics which relate to Scottish, British, and European internet law and policy issues. Uh, we also um, are involved in um, advising government, uh, parliament, other uh, public authorities, um, as well as businesses and NGOs on these issues as well, both in our um, local area, or our nation of Scotland, uh, nation state of the UK, um, EU, uh, Council of Europe, and at the international level as well. Um, among our group are also uh, researchers with interests in other parts of the world as well, uh, particularly the Asia Pacific. And um, we have growing interest in um, internet law and policy issues in the African continent as well. Um, in normal times, we do welcome visiting academics to join our research community. Um, there are links in this presentation in the PowerPoint, uh, which you should be able to access in the chat. Um, if you want, if you're interested in coming to visit us, if you come from another university, uh, we can facilitate uh, visits as well. Um, in normal times anyway, and we welcomed um, a visitor from Italy just before the university um, shut down earlier this year. Uh, we hope to return to that in um, the future, although again, I suppose we don't know exactly when. Um, also, uh, we do run events. Um, we were running a series of research seminars in Glasgow uh, before um, this current disruption and for the foreseeable future we will be running webinars um, such as this one I think usually on the first Friday lunchtime UK time of the month 
um, that is our normal time to have events um, and it was the normal time before we went online and we're going to aim to continue that uh, for the foreseeable future, which actually means that uh, more people can participate and we should actually consider doing some kind of blended online, offline events in the future as well. Um, in addition to this, um, if anyone is interested in um, further study in the area of internet law and policy, uh, we actually uh, run an LLM course on internet law and policy and IT and telecommunications law, which even prior to the current coronavirus outbreak um, and lockdowns was a fully online distance learning course and it will continue to be so. So it's fully set up um, to be delivered in this way. Okay. Um, so, um, if you do have any questions about the research that we do, um, the kinds of advice that we provide, visits, uh, PhDs, etc., uh, the LLM, please don't hesitate um, to contact us uh, for more information. Um, but for now, I'm going to move um, to the substance of today, which is why I think most of you are here um, to talk about some research that I've conducted on 3D printing, policing and crime. So this research that I'm going to talk about today actually relates to an article which is forthcoming in the journal Policing and Society that was co-authored with collaborators in the UK and in Australia. So um, particularly like to acknowledge my co-authors, Monique Mann, Peter Squires and Rhys Walters, um, who we collaboratively did this research and um, wrote this article. So for those of you who do have access to academic databases, you can obviously find it there and read it. Anyone who wants a copy that doesn't have access, feel free to contact me and I'm happy to share a preprint version with you. So today's presentation is based on the um, material in that article. So before um, I actually get to the substance of the policing and crime issues uh, relating to 3D printing, it's uh, useful, I think, to give a uh, an overview of what 3D printing actually is. So in English at least, 3D printing is also often called additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing tends to be the more technical or um, uh, I suppose perhaps more precise term particularly used in engineering for 3D printing, but 3D printing is the more common term um, that is more generally used. So I will use the term 3D printing. So this um, diagram should give you a, um, a very basic understanding, I hope, of what the 3D printing process looks like. So 3D printers or additive manufacturing is a manufacturing technique um, which involves um, different specific uh, processes um, in different 3D printers. But the general idea is that um, a three-dimensional object is created um, based on a computer-aided design file, which is where the PC um, is relevant, connected to a 3D printing machine. This is quite a basic one here, um, which would have an input of raw material. In this case, it's a plastic. Most cheap 3D printers use plastics. And then on the basis of the, the computer-aided design file, the object uh, the design for the object contained within that, um, the 3D printing machine uh, seen here on the left, um, will, using the raw materials, create that object, um, usually on the basis of um, creating the object layer by layer. Um, so starting at the bottom and building up. And um, in this way, this gives rise to the term additive manufacturing um, because you are creating an object um, from scratch, uh, layer by layer. This can be contrasted with previous forms of manufacturing techniques, which have retrospectively been called subtractive manufacturing, when you may have or you usually have a much larger piece of raw material, whether it's wood or plastics um, or metals or whatever else, that will then be uh, subtracted or parts will be taken off it to make the manufactured item. So 3D printing represents 
where additive manufacturing represents quite a revolution in many um, senses in engineering manufacturing um, that objects that would have been very difficult to make before or possibly impossible uh, can now be made much more easily with 3D printing. Now there is um, a very wide range of different forms of 3D printers from very cheap machines that are now available for under a um, thousand pounds or a thousand dollars or a thousand euros um, to very expensive machines that cost millions of pounds, euros, uh, dollars, etc. Um, it tends to be that the cheaper machines use kind of cheap raw materials, particularly plastics, whereas the more uh, sophisticated machines will use more sophisticated materials, uh, particularly metals. Uh, we don't currently have very cheap metal printers at the moment, but this is um, what is likely that advances in technology and in uh, processes will give rise um, to cheaper um, 3D printers that can print for instance, in metal. Um, but there, it is important to rec realize that there are a huge amount of um, different 3D printers from very expensive to very um, cheap. Okay, and just as an example of a cheap 3D printer, this is what a kind of cheap one would look like. This one costs under 700 pounds. Um, you can use it um, to make particularly um, items using plastics. Um, in fact, with the current coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, these kind of cheaper 3D printers are actually being used throughout the world uh, to create um, things like personal protective equipment in hospitals, also to print uh, spare parts for machines, notably uh, um, ventilators, which are necessary in the pandemic. Um, and all these 3D printers that were in schools and universities and even in people's houses, sometimes being used, sometimes not being used, are now uh, finding a uh, purpose at the moment um, in creating uh, personal protective equipment and other forms of objects necessary for countering the pandemic um, that are currently in short supply. But anyway, that's what, if you haven't seen one already, that's what a cheap 3D printer would look like. Um, it's within the purchasing power of um, consumers, especially in richer countries, um, but isn't perhaps even so expensive um, for um, at least institutions in um, developing countries as well. So that would be a, an example of a cheap uh, printer. Okay, so if you do have a 3D printer, where do you get material done? The sense of content from. So raw materials, yes, you need um, some form of plastic filament for those cheaper printers, uh, more complex raw materials, uh, for instance, wood or metal um, or other uh, forms. Um, glass is something which is also uh, 3D printed as well. They would be used in the more complex um, and more expensive machines. However, you do also need um, some form of computer-aided design file for the 3D printer. Um, so if you're printing this out yourself, uh, one very important hub for 3D printed, um, for 3D printing design files is Thingiverse. Um, and this is a screenshot from the uh, front page. So most of the Thingiverse um, designs um, are uploaded by 3D printing enthusiasts, amateurs, sometimes people who are more professional as well. And they use Creative Commons and free software licensing um, to facilitate free downloads of the files um, for other 3D printing enthusiasts. So the idea with this is it's a kind of commons where files are uploaded and files can be downloaded. Um, and for those who are interested, you can um, have a um, look at the kinds of things that you can um, download from there. Um, lots of kind of novelties, toys, uh, some um, design files for jewellery, um, but also spare parts. Um, and as you can see, um, they are currently um, uh, devoting their efforts um, to um, designing and creating facial covering tools um, to assist with the current pandemic. Um, but things that are very complex or would involve very complex forms of materials are unlikely to be uploaded and downloaded from Thingiverse. 
files for items that are of high value um, or that may have a high um, IP value are also unlikely to be uploaded and downloaded. But these repositories are one place where you can find design files if you have a 3D printer yourself. Another part of the 3D printing ecosystem are um, these um, make on demand sites. Um, so really more a kind of e-commerce platform. Shapeways is the most uh, prominent, at least in the Western world. Uh, what you would do is upload a file to Shapeways. Shapeways will, has a suite of um, sophisti more sophisticated expensive 3D printers that perhaps the average person or even institution like a school might not have access to. So you upload your file, uh, Shapeways will give you a price for how much it would cost to print out the particular item that your file contains in different forms of um, materials, metals, um, plastics, um, other, I think they also have other materials as well. Um, another, so it's more of a kind of e-commerce uh, print on demand site. It will then print whatever your object is and send it to you uh, wherever you live. Um, another aspect of Shapeways is that I can upload a file and other people, let's say for a piece of jewellery, other people uh, will see my uploaded file and can buy a 3D printed um, version of that uh, jewellery design. So maybe for a pendant, you can choose what colour, what kind of material it's printed out in. So this is a more of an e-commerce oriented option, um, but the advantages with Shapeways would be that you could have uh, 3D printed objects which are probably too expensive um, or access to a 3D printer which would be too expensive or difficult um, otherwise. So I just wanted to kind of um, give an introduction to 3D printing itself and some of the 3D printing ecosystem before I go on to talk about 3D printing, policing and crime. Okay, so 3D printing can be used for many, many things as we hopefully know by now in the current uh, coronavirus pandemic, 3D printers are being used for equipment, um, they're being used for uh, printing spare parts and supply chains, all usually very um, good and important um, uses of the technology. However, when 3D printing um, actually came to public attention in many countries, it was for a more scary and um, problematic um, use of the technology, which was the use of 3D printing to print weapons and particularly guns. So in 2013, um, an American uh, organization called Defense Distributed released uh, design files um, for 3D printers, uh, which would print out parts of what it claimed would be a functioning weapon with uh, the addition of a few additional aspects, um, a few additional parts that you could buy from a hardware store. Now, this was a great, caused a great sensation at the time and really brought, brought 3D printing uh, to the attention of um, the public. Those of you who are familiar with um, gun regulations um, or in fact uh, the US um, legal system and political culture will be aware of um, the fact that the US is quite unusual in the sense that there is a constitutional right for um, US citizens uh, to bear arms. How that has been interpreted um, throughout the years and um, the restrictions on that right um, has created a huge body of case law in the US and also commentary. It is important to note that um, I think it'd be very difficult for a company or an initiative like Defence Distributed to emerge in other jurisdictions. Most other jurisdictions have much stricter legal limits on um, citizens' possession of guns. So the UK where I am, Australia where I conducted this research, um, it is um, generally prohibited for citizens um, to have guns or other forms of lethal weapons. Um, there are some people who are able to obtain licenses um, to have them, but there is not a general right that the population has um, to um, bear arms in the same way 
as in the US. Now, um, precisely what that uh, right in the US actually means, the Second Amendment to the US Constitution um, has been debated at length, um, also through Supreme Court jurisprudence, um, through case law from um, state courts as well. Um, and reg the right is not um, unrestrained. So there have been various kind of attempts to regulate um, what the right to bear arms actually means, regulation of the manufacture of arms, um, this is in the US, um, in, some in some cases regulating uh, whether certain categories of people are actually able to um, buy guns as well. However, the idea with Defence Distributed was um, behind their initiative was a very strong libertarian um, ideology which wanted to bring the rights contained in the Second Amendment um, to all Americans at least um, and circumvent some of these attempts to restrict um, the access to arms which had been um, implemented over the years. Um, another aspect of this is that uh, previously creating this kind of weapon by yourself would have been quite difficult if you did not have um, different tools and also some kind of know-how about how to uh, construct uh, a gun. 3D printing, um, in theory, brings uh, the ability to make complex objects, which previously would have been too difficult because it would have involved um, access to machinery that would be very expensive and difficult to use. So it, 3D printing arguably brings forward the possibility of um, a democratization of the ability to create complex items. Now, some of those complex items might be quite socially important and desirable. Some of them, like guns, although it's up for debate, but I would, my own position is uh, the creation of guns is something less socially desirable, but the idea is 3D printing would democratize this. So, in short, uh, with this background, this US. Um, company in 2013 released uh, computer-aided design files about how to use a fairly cheap 3D printer to print out parts of a gun and released these on the internet and they were downloaded thousands of times or hundreds of thousands of times um, in the period that they were online initially, um, giving rise to a lot of uh, sensation, moral panic, hysteria, fear, um, etc. Now, in countries outside of the US where there are stricter um, laws regulating uh, the possession of firearms, and even in the US where there still is some regulation of who precisely can access firearms in what circumstances, this, the idea of having a 3D printed gun or gun parts um, in principle disrupts uh, the operation of these laws which were designed um, on the basis that well yes there is a black market in guns um, and yes it is possible even prior to 3D printing to make your own firearm it was very difficult and so accessing these kinds of uh, weapons was difficult. However having a more democratized form of manufacture, the price of 3D printing, the, um, the availability of files such as these to create a gun um, in principle presents a challenge to the effective enforcement um, and also design of previous gun laws. Okay, now in the, in the US itself, um, there has been um, a long um, legal, um, legal challenge and battle um, that Defence Distributed have uh, been involved in with regards to whether um, the Second Amendment and also the First Amendment, uh, the very strong right to free speech in the US, actually allows them um, to release um, these design files. Um, and in our paper, we talk more about um, this battle and um, its um, and what has happened in the end, which is that, well, it, which is quite complicated and also based on um, different uh, states 
approaches um, to this particular issue. Um, I'm not going to go into that here, um, but suffice to say there is not a definitive Supreme Court judgment on whether what defence distributed have done is uh, permitted or not under the First and Second Amendment. What I'm going to talk about here is more what has happened since 2013 in practice, or trying to answer the question, what has happened since 2013? Because on the one hand, 3D printing and the availability of these design files presents a conceptual theoretical challenge to the effective enforcement um, and containment of firearms, particularly in countries where there are there are more restrictions around this, but what has actually happened in practice? Has 3D printing been extremely disruptive? Have we seen a lot of people printing out their own guns and using them? Um, or has the situation been somewhat more complex? So that's the aspect of the paper I'm going to focus on for the rest of this um, presentation. But if you're interested in the more uh, legalistic aspect, particularly in the US, then you can um, read about that more in the paper. Okay. So as I've mentioned before, I think what the main issue really here is um, that with 3D printing, we have a decentralized manufacturing technology. In some ways, it can be quite cheap. I showed you um, that um, printer, which is available for under um, 700 pounds. Uh, people can, in principle, use these 3D printers to make things that would have been too difficult uh, pre because of cost, complexity and availability. And the problem with a technology like 3D printing is that it can be used for both good and bad things. Um, a term which is often used is it's a dual or multi-use technology. It's easy to prohibit something which is only used for bad or criminal um, items, but similarly to the internet itself, which can be used for many uh, good purposes, but also used for bad purposes like cybercrime. Um, when you have a technology that can be used for more than one purpose, then it presents more problems about how that should be regulated and governed. Um, so um, that's really the underlying issue with 3D printing. And um, I'm concentrating today on the crime and policing aspects, uh, particularly with regards to firearms, but that firearm regulation is not the only area of law and its enforcement, which 3D printing in principle disrupts. Um, intellectual property is another area I have also um, researched on that, as well as various others, um, but um, that's not the only area. Also discussion in the medical sphere around medical device regulation and the extent to which the use of 3D printing in the medical sector um, disrupts that regulation as well. Anyway, this is the overlying, the, um, sorry, the overwhelming issue with 3D printing. It can be used for good and bad things. It can facilitate the creation of objects that were too difficult to create before. Um, and um, the question is really to what extent um, are various areas of law disrupted in theory and in practice by this. Okay, and just um, to reiterate with regards to 3D printing in crime and policing, again, our uh, paper doesn't really concentrate on this aspect, but even within this general topic, um, the story of 3D printing is not only the story of criminal uses or potentially criminal uses of 3D printing, for instance, to make guns, but actually it's also being used uh, by police forces throughout the world for their own purposes too. So um, that kind of adds some complexity to the picture regarding 3D printing, policing and crime, that police forces also use 3D printing and scanning techniques, uh, particularly in um, forensics. Um, so here um, there's a recent initiative in the, uh, England with the West Midlands Police and uh, Warwick University uh, to create this centre for um, 3D printing and scanning, um, how that can be used in investigation um, and, um, I'm sorry, <coughs> investigation and forensics um, by police forces. So that's the other um, side of the story, but the more exciting side, of course, is obviously 3D printed guns. 
Okay, so um, really what I wanted to focus on here um, was uh, the part of the paper where we tried to do some empirical research um, to understand um, how prevalent 3D printed guns and other weapons actually are in practice. So if we think back to 2013, a lot of uh, hysteria, concern, upset around the emergence of the 3D printed gun and the possibilities that that has brought. Um, what is actually happening in practice though? How prevalent are these guns? How prevalent are other 3D printed um, weapons? And this actually understanding this um, helps us to understand how much of a threat 3D printing poses um, to current cr criminal laws, but particularly regarding firearms and obviously public safety. Um, the research that we have done in this paper um, does face um, various limitations. Um, it was very difficult for us to actually access um, available data or actually understand what data is available about um, the prevalence of 3D printed guns and whether this data even exists in the first place. Um, many police forces don't even know the answer to this question. Um, they're not tracking um, this um, to see how often um, for instance, they are coming across what they suspect to be 3D printed guns or other weapons, or even if they do have this information, they did not want to tell us um, about it um, at the time. So it, there was a very big problem that we faced, which was actually understanding what um, is happening um, and what data exists or creating that data um, if it doesn't exist in the first place. And of course, um, what the police um, say about the issue isn't necessarily the full picture either. So what we managed to do, um, and a method which faces various limitations, was examine media reports in a period of five years uh, between 2013 when the 3D printed gun uh, was released or the blueprints for it were released and 2018. Um, various limitations. We looked at um, media reports in the English language. Um, we also looked at reports where there was some news about a 3D printed gun or something that was suspected to be a 3D printed gun or gun parts or other 3D printed weapons such as knuckle dusters being found. Um, it's like I say, there are various limitations to this, verifying the accuracy of the media reports. Um, they usually reported police raids, which had come across um, these um, items. So it was also based on the police actually accurately identifying something to be a 3D printed gun, gun part, or other form of weapon. Um, also, of course, um, language aspects. So we were, we were only looking at, at what was available in English, um, although many instances in other countries, non-English speaking countries were translated into English because there's a lot of sensation about 3D printed guns, of course, um, and, it, and um, news stories tend to pick up on that. Um, but I think one of the um, biggest challenges is that um, this is only what is being kind of reported what about things that are not coming to light? And usually, um, as you can read in more detail in our paper, um, usually the, thing, the examples of 3D printed guns or other weapons that were being reported were based on uh, police raids and usually police raids for some other reason, so particularly uh, suspected drugs offences. But at the same time, they seem to find 3D printers and things that look like gun parts or other weapons. Um, so what about the cases that are not um, on the radar? Uh, what about situations where people might be using 3D printers to make guns or other weapons, uh, but they're more effective in keeping that secret and out of the limelight? Um, for instance, they may not be involved in other forms of crimes such as drugs offences as well. So really I think this presents a very narrow uh, picture of what may or may not be happening, um, but it was as, um, as good as it got for us in terms of accessing some data because there's currently no data about this and we face a lot of challenges trying to get information, for instance, from police forces. So while this isn't a comprehensive picture, at least it presents something um, of uh, insight into 
what is actually happening with 3D printed weapons in practice. Although, like I say, it's certainly not the full picture. Okay, so this might be easier to see if people can download the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, but this is a table of the instances that we could find, um, or the main instances that we could find between 2013 and 2018, like all those parameters and limitations um, uh, taken account of. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think what we found interesting was that there were many cases appearing in Australia, some cases in the UK, Israel, Japan, other parts of Europe as well. But Australia seemed to account for a disproportionate amount, uh, given all of our limitations from before, um, even taking into account we were looking mainly at English language we're looking only at English language reports, but nevertheless, we saw, uh, we, we think that Australia, um, uh, there seem to be many cases in Australia of people using 3D, or a disproportionate amount of cases in Australia, uh, given the population um, of people um, using 3D printers uh, to print guns or gun parts um, in that five year period that we looked at. Okay, and also, I mean, subsequent to our, um, the data that we collected, uh, we actually, something that did not, uh, we escaped our data set uh, was um, another case in the UK of a university student in London who had manufactured a 3D printed firearm who's actually been um, jailed for three years um, from the end of last year. Um, so while we thought that there was a disproportionate amount of these instances happening in um, Australia, they also are happening elsewhere. And this is a case which has um, occurred since um, our um, data was collected, or at least, sorry, was um, the person was uh, sentenced since the case, our data was collected. But the actual um, incident happened in 2017. Interestingly though, this when I uh, read the report, this actually supports um, some of our findings or tensive findings um, that 3D printed weapons are being detected in police raids, which seem to be for other purposes. So this case, in this case, um, it seemed to be that this person was raided by the police for suspected drugs offences. So there also seems to be a, co a connection between 3D printed um, weapons being found and um, people who are engaging in um, illicit conduct around drugs in particular. Okay, so just the main findings um, of our uh, research um, was that from what we can understand, or at least from what is occurring in media reports, there isn't a very widespread use of 3D printing to create illicit firearms. But that is given all the caveats that I uh, said before around, um, we're only perhaps seeing a very uh, limited amount of the picture through, through these media reports. Um, the examples of guns and other weapons being created by 3D printing that are being detected are being detected by law enforcement agencies, um, at least in countries such as um, the UK and Australia. So this idea that there is kind of no uh, control that can be exercised over 3D printing or the use of 3D printing in particular to create uh, illegal items um, such as weapons and particularly firearms, um, doesn't seem to be borne out by the practice. So people are, in some cases, making these weapons, but they also are being detected by the police. But as I've said just before, um, a lot of the detection seems to be happening in the context of um, investigations for other potential criminal activities, particularly uh, illegal drugs. So. Um, as I've said, that case in London uh, seemed to actually reinforce our uh, kind of tentative finding um, on this particular point, um, that which also raises questions about uh, what is not being found um, if people are using 3D printers um, to create um, illicit um, or illegal objects, um, but they're not involved, for instance, in um, other forms of illegal activity. And particularly Australia, uh, we wondered about whether Australia's geographical isolation 
um, may be an explanation for why there seem to be a disproportionately high amount of cases occurring in Australia, um, that perhaps um, the black or grey markets in conventionally produced firearms um, are not as active in Australia or it's more difficult for these kinds of weapons um, through um, illegal or semi-legal means uh, to be um, accessed in Australia because of its isolation. So um, in that sense, perhaps 3D printing um, and other forms of um, manufacturing at home um, are attractive it's specifically in Australia because of geographical isolation, whereas perhaps in other parts of the world it may be easier, although I don't know personally from personal experience, but it may be easier to access um, uh, black or grey markets in conventionally produced weapons compared to Australia. Um, so that may account for why we saw some more cases in Australia than elsewhere. Okay. So um, nevertheless, I think this represents a very um, limited view of the situation. Um, as I've said, the media reports are only a very small and possibly not very accurate or representative picture of um, the prevalence of 3D printed weapons um, and their uh, creation and use um, in ways that would be against the law, particularly the criminal law. Um, so I think there's a huge amount of scope for further research. And there's also um, uh, some uh, concerning aspects about uh, developments in 3D printing technology in the sense that um, if 3D printers, particularly metal printers, become more and more accessible and easier and easier to use, uh, will this make it more attractive to use them to produce illicit um, goods and also at the moment of course there is a lot of disruption uh, to global conventional global supply chains uh, I would also imagine for uh, illicit or illegal goods and services as well as for legal and illicit goods and services so will this make kind of self-production or um, localized production for both legal and illegal goods and services more attractive even with the constraints of the technology that we have at the moment. Um, and I think there is also more research to be done about current firearms laws and how effective they are both in their design and implementation to deal with any threats from 3D printing. Um, that there's a lot there's a lot of discussion about um, how disruptive 3D printing is to different areas of law, but um, the reality may be that um, the design of the law is broad enough to cover this new technology, but the issues perhaps are with implementation and enforcement. And that seems to be um, a conclusion that many draw from in the medical device sphere, um, and particularly uh, Antonia Horst, who I think is actually on this call at, or um, tuning into this webinar at the moment. Um, so I think there are still questions uh, looking beyond the hype and hysteria about um, current legal frameworks and how flexible they are to deal with technological innovation. And they may actually be flexible enough um, and I think particularly uh, the case of 3D printing and firearms laws may also be another example where there is sufficient flexibility to deal with this new form of manufacture. Anyway, I think these are all topics for further research um, and research that perhaps my, myself and my collaborators may do or research that could be done by others as well. So I'm going to leave it here um, and say kind of thank you very much. Um, and we've got some time for questions. I'm also going to stop sharing the screen and stop the recording as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela.